I'm grateful to IT for Change and IDRC, of course, for not only inviting, which is obvious, uh, but also for setting up this wonderful panel and the exciting panelists and very kind panelists who I, I think they, all they did is, is setting up what I would talk about right now, as, as you can see. Um, this paper that are, that are present uh, draws from my ongoing research on the history of computing by the government of India. And my interest is to foreground a specific quote-unquote new imagination of inclusion that is coming up in the context of governance through big data in India. I'll talk about the Aadhaar project or the UIDI project uh, that Anjali mentioned. And I'll talk about infrastructures of production of data that Tim talked about. The formation of the unique identification authority of India, henceforth UIDAI, is a key event in the recent history of electric, electronic governance in India. It's an elaborate exercise in making the residents of the country, as opposed to citizens of the country, uniquely addressable by randomly generated unique identification numbers. And these numbers are called Aadhaar numbers, hence the project is also popularly called the Aadhaar project. The key thing here is that this number and its relationship with the person needs to be verified from time to time. So that when the person goes to a government office and says that this is my number, there has to be something that allows the person to verify that the number really is assigned to him or her. The identifiable population that UIDI creates is not meant to be the same as the ones that already exist on various governmental data sets. But most importantly, it is meant to resolve the disjunctures, disjunctures between the multiple databases of governance in India. It plans to do so by claiming both systematic integrity which means that they have carried out this number assigning process completely anew, and also kind of a systematic registration of individuals residing in the country. So they have gone across the country and done a new round of registration, rather than building the system on existing databases. But also by ensuring continuous biometric re-verification of the linkage between the other number and the person it has been assigned to. The paper, however, does not attempt an examination of either of these two claims. So I'm not arguing against whether it has been systematic enough. I'm not arguing against whether the biometric system works or not. There have been works happening in India on those points, and uh, I can refer you to that if you want to read it. I'm interested in kind of setting up this particular project in a larger discussion about doing governance, doing electronic governance in India. Taha Mahmood begins an extensive survey of the quote-unquote contested history of national identity cards in India with the Kargil War of 99. So this was the India-Pakistan war or kind of a conflict in 99. And the subsequent report of the Kargil Review Committee. This review committee said that the, one of the problems that this conflict happened is there aren't nationally enforced identity cards for people living in the border areas. The same demand came back in the aftermath of the attack on the Indian Parliament on December 13, 2001. Jump to 2007. In 2007, the entitlement reform for empowering the poor, the integrated smart card, there was this report called Entitlement Reform for Empowering the Poor through an integrated smart card. So this report was uh, published by the Planning Commission and presented a futuristic scenario of welfare delivery through multi-application smart cards, or MASC. It was conceptualized as a multi-storied building wherein each scheme is housed in a separate flow, while the unique ID, this card, will manage the main entrance to the building, while each scheme administering agency will have the key for entering of various other flows. So it's one ID card which you need to enter the building of the government. And then if you are eligible for each particular schemes, you get to enter those flows and whatnot. I'll come back to this. This remains one of the most succinct, succinct description of the desired function of the unique identity number. The terms unique identification and citizen ID was both used by Nandan Nilekani in a magazine article where he wrote about how a single citizen ID can get rid of the phantoms that haunt the welfare delivery systems of India. In the same article, Nilakani provided an early roadmap of the approach of the Aadhaar project, 
and critiqued the then ongoing folly of identifying the issuing of smart cards as the main challenge of implementing such a system. He argued it is in the making the backend infrastructure secure and scalable, providing a single record keeper for the whole country and integrating the agents who issue these numbers where it gets tough. The Central Identities Data Repository, or the CIDR, rests at the center of the information infrastructure, which is imagined and being deployed by the other project. On one hand, this centralized repository of all assigned other numbers, along with corresponding demographic, biometric, and additional information collected during the enrollment process. This entire bundle, so when a person is given this number, the demographic data, biometric data, which is 10 fingers and iris scan, as well as additional information, such as mobile phone number, landline number, um, bank account number, and so on, that has been given by this person gets matched to a particular random number. Random number is also important because the number does not represent the person in any, any way except the, the arbitrary connection, of course. When a new bundle of demographic and bio biometric data enters the other system, for assignment of a new Aadhaar number, first the uniqueness of the bundle is established by comparing it with already existing bundles in the CIDR. This is called deduplication. On the other hand, the CIDR can receive the combination of any one piece of biometric data, so either iris scan or finger scan, from a person and his or her Aadhaar number, and it can undertake one is to one authentication processes. So it can go to the bundle um, numbered with that other number and see whether that finger scan exists in that bundle or not. It's not a one is to n authentication if you, if you know the uh, technological thing. Um, an authorized biometric identification device can send such an authentication request to the CIDR and will receive the result as a yes or no message. So from the outlook so far, it seems like a rather secure and rather thought through thing because it does not tell anyone whether, um, so the response it gives is yes, no. It's not that any kind of information is sent back. So there is little possibility of that information, biometric information leaking out of the system. There is significantly um, well documented encryption protocols are in place. So when a particular bundle of data is being sent to this central identities data repository, the, the, the previous and security questions are kind of taken care of. But it also sets up something new, right? So there's some old anxieties associated with, just to go back to that, with the Aadhaar issue in India. One of that is that um, the registration process is flawed. So not everybody is getting in. Um, and other things. So th there are legal problems. CIDR is truly speaking, not, an not a legal thing in India yet. There is, no, there is no act or law backing it up. But I would say those are old anxieties. I'm interested in the new expression that big data driven governance is taking place, shape in India. The CIDR thus performs a fundamental and critical infrastructural operation for linking the distributed agency specific data sets, that is government agency specific data sets, across agencies of all size and scale which have been in inherited from the past decades of information systems and paper-based information systems largely. Incorporating the other number and disbursement of a particular kind of government subsidy does not provide the disbursing agency with an eligible beneficiary for dis disbursement, but with a person with a verifiable unique identification number. This number, that is the other number, allows the disbursing agency to maintain databases and access external databases, if and when possible, of the history of all the financial and governmental transactions of the people concerned. To take a step back, when the, the public distribution system, say, I mean, this is a design fiction, this is what I'm talking about is hypothesis. Um, say when the public distribution system decides whether Tim or I would, would uh, uh, we are eligible to receive a particular subsidy, what the other system gives or provides the PDS with is not the ID of an eligible beneficiary, but it is providing it with an ID which can be used by PDS, the public distribution system, to search through all kinds of governmental databases, 
as well as non-governmental databases if it has access to, and see what has been the past digital traces of that ID. So it allows for a certain kind of a extended relational databases to be created, not at the end of the Aadhaar project or Aadhaar database itself. So there, this kind of, uh, um, kind of, this kind of um, critics as well in India that the Aadhaar database is accumulating data. The problem is it's not. It's creating an infrastructure for other people to mine through all kinds of governmental data sets. Let me jump. The Aadhaar project conceptualizes the phenomenon of inclusion through intertwined terminologies of access and delivery. These terms, access and delivery, stand for an ideological collapsing of the agencies that provide welfare services and uphold human rights, and the diverging modalities of relationships between those who access services and those who deliver them. This conceptual blurring of governmental, semi-governmental, and private providers of welfare and infrastructural services deeply undermine the available and effective modes of demanding of services and rights by the citizens. The universalizing, where are you? The universalizing infrastructures of network governance, such as those being enabled by the other project, are developing the material basis for seamless information sharing between various agencies, governmental agencies, but soon, I guess, private agencies as well. Because private agencies who would have to provide governmental or welfare services, not governmental services, would be accessing the same database to verify their own customers and so on. Customers, yeah. So end with two provocations. I wouldn't take more than further two minutes. One is the idea of platform, which I haven't mentioned yet. But platform is something that comes up in the other discourse completely. So what they say is we are providing a digital identity platform for delivery of governmental services. And, and as you know, the idea of platform and its location in, in Web 2.0 social media business world, and, and that's something to, to be think about. What Aadhaar is building is a platform for governmental agencies to share data, to share data on the basis of uniquely identifiable numbers to represent each citizen. Technological imagination and material effects of design fictions and reconfigurations of the bureaucratic structure through code. What is happening is the Aadhaar project cuts across existing databases, existing acts of, of governing, of protecting governmental data sets by coming up with this particular one ID that cuts across all these, these kind of governmental data silos, right? The last point is, to go back to the name of the panel, um, how, how would we study techno power? What I suggest here is a, I would say, material approach. This refers to political economy on one hand, and this goes more towards um, what Anjali was talking about. Um, this peripheralization, marginalization, and centralization of things, of nodes. But I would also like to emphasize uh, it in a latter sense, in, in a second sense, where the materiality is the, as the focus on physical hardware, network infrastructures, physically speaking, as real things, but also the protocols. The protocol in social sense, but protocol also in software sense. The protocols of governing, and I'm always very provoked by this uh, term that Tim O'Reilly talked about. He talked about the architecture of cooperation. So how is the cooperation, in this case, it, I, I use it quite darkly, cooperation between private and public organizations, companies, um, are being architected through the software layers of allowing such cooperation. Thank you so much.